Good afternoon and welcome to the ACYPL Virtual Town Hall Series. My name is Mandy Powers Norell. I'm an alum of ACYPL India, Cuba, and New Zealand exchanges. Uh, today, we are excited to bring you our ACYPL Town Hall on Indigenous Communities in the United States. Our panelists bring years of both professional and personal experience working with Indigenous communities. And as we dive into pressing issues facing the Indigenous populations of the United States, we're very, very lucky to have them with us. Today's town hall will cover how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected indigenous communities, challenges indigenous people face in the legal system, the significance of the appointment of the first indigenous secretary, Deb Holland, and voting rights for indigenous people. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce my fellow ACYPL alums and panelists. Christina Blackcloud, is the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Coordinator for the Sac and Fox Tribe of the Mississippi in Iowa, a position that she has held since April of this year. She's a member of the Sac and Fox Tribe herself, and prior to her current role, Christina has served as Director of Business Development and Government Contracting for Fox Professional Services and has served as the Director of Senior Services for the Sac and Fox Tribe of Iowa. Afi Ellis is a member of the Wyoming Senate representing the 8th Senate District and she was elected to the position in 2016 and is the is she's a member of the Navajo Nation and is the first Native American to become a member of the Senate in Wyoming. I, I found that so surprising. In addition to her role as Senator, Afi is also of counsel at the law firm of Holland and Hart LLP. She is also on the board of directors for the Navajo Nation Gaming Enterprise and an adjunct professor at the University of Wyoming, teaching courses on federal Indian law and American Indian studies. Thank you both for joining us. Yes, I'm excited to be and here. So to begin, <laughs> we want to start this discussion. Awesome, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so impressed with both of you. It's just gonna be, um, it's gonna be a great, a great panel, I think. And so we wanna start by reflecting on the global pandemic that has affected all of us and, and sent us to Zoom to find uh, new, new ways of connecting. Uh, we wanna talk about how this pandemic is affecting indigenous communities because they've been hit very hard by the uh, coronavirus and I think are responding in, um, in unconventional ways that other communities uh, may not be. So um, Senator Ellis, should I call you Senator Ellis or Affie? Affie's fine. Okay, fine. thank you, thank you. I didn't want to presume. Um, so Affie, how has the uh, pandemic affected the indigenous communities in Wyoming? Well, thank you, Mandy, and thanks to everyone at ACYPL. Um, you know, I think that this is a, such a special community and anyone who's traveled on an ACYPL uh, mission appreciates that we are, are kind of our own small family. So I think it's a really cool opportunity to share our expertise um, through these town hall meetings. So thank you for creating this forum for us to get together. Um, you know, COVID this year has been a challenging one for states, for tribes. And I think that, um, you know, unfortunately, despite all of the, the things that we've been struggling with, there have been some really wonderful things that have come from it too. And one of them is having these kind of forums. But um, when it comes to Indian country and COVID, there are, you know, not just one or two tribes out there, there are hundreds. And I think a lot of people are aware, aren't even aware that there are some, you know, 470 plus federally recognized Indian tribes across our country. And so how it affects COVID, you know, depends on which tribe you're talking to. But there are some unique circumstances for a lot of tribes that make COVID particularly troublesome. One is the lack of housing on reservations means that in a lot of native families, they're intergenerational homes. So you don't just have a typical mom and dad with a couple of kids living there, but large families, aunts and uncles, grandparents. And so when one of those family members gets hit with COVID, um, the spread is that much more magnified just because of the sheer number of people living in their homes. Um, other factors that have made it even more challenging are the fact that a lot of um, native communities aren't, are struggling with their health issues of their community in general. Um, diabetes, uh, you know, heart disease, all of those things affect Native people for a variety of reasons. But when you add something like COVID to the mix, it becomes even more um, difficult to make sure that you're keeping those folks alive. And then lastly, I think most people aren't aware of just the stretch limitations of health access to healthcare on reservations. Um, you know, through federal policies, a lot of reservations use something called the Indian Health Service, a federal clinic. 
Um, but those, you know, depending on the size of the reservation, if you have a large land based reservation, um, it can take a while to get there. And then, um, you know, there's financial staffing issues and, and just space capacity. So all of those kind of create this perfect storm for a thing like COVID to be particularly damaging for native communities. In Wyoming, when the uh, COVID first entered our state, there was a time where native deaths accounted for a third of our population's deaths that were related to COVID. And so the response on the reservation has been a much different than it has been in the state of Wyoming. Uh, more aggressive mask mandates, social distancing, canceling of events and things like that. And so right now, I believe right now, Wyoming has seen 809 COVID deaths and to date 51 of those deaths were uh, Native Americans who reside within our state's borders. So, you know, I think the, the thing that we're trying to take away is, you know, the state might have different responses to how it wants to contain COVID that might be different than um, the tribe's response. And so really it is um, trying to respect some of those boundaries, but it, there are difficulties in that too. So, um, you know, we want, for example, we want to be respectful of our tribe's decisions, but what is the reach of that when it comes to state employees like school teachers that are teaching in Wyoming funded schools on the reservation. So we're, we're really sorting through some of those issues, but I'm sure my colleague can talk a little bit more um, in depth about just the, the healthy nature of native people and some of the work she's been doing to, you know, return um, those native communities to their food sovereignty. So I'll, I'll yield to Christina. <laughs> Thank you, Afi. Um, that was a great background on, on the response for tribal nations to be able to, res um, in response to COVID. But I know for our tribe, the Second Fox tribe in the Mississippi and Iowa is also known as Meskwaki Nation. We're the only federally recognized tribe in Iowa. And um, we have a smaller population of just over 1400 tribal citizens. But um, our response, it, it was very similar to other um, tribal nations where they're very, they closed a lot of the um, areas of, out to the public. For example, one of our largest public events, like our annual powwow, that has been canceled for the second year in a row. We have um, mask requirements in our building still, and that exceeds our Iowa requirements. Uh, also, we have a higher response rate for the COVID vaccinations here. We have a 85, over 85% 85 immune um, COVID pe uh, people that have received the COVID shots, and that's extremely important because we got we reach herd immunity. And when we make the decisions here within our community, we want to make sure we protect our elders and our youth. And uh, whenever, in my position as the food sovereignty coordinator, we have a long history of growing our own corn, you know, our beans and squash. That's in our everyday lifestyle in, in hopes to bring back a healthier lifestyle. So I, within my position, I'm able to, you know, advocate for those issues of healthier eating, healthier responses, you know, try to lessen our diabetes rate. We have wonderful partnerships with our diabetes program and this and that, but with the COVID response rate, it, you know, we've shut down right away. Uh, we're, we're still um, very much shut down other than our casino, but our, our government, all our meetings are still Zoom, but our leadership, like our health director, Rudy Papaki, he's on it, he informs our community of when someone is, uh, or whenever we have people that are affected, affected with that, uh, COVID, and he um, provides that guidance actually to the community in an open space on social media. And it's, it's very helpful for the community to make their decisions and responses in that aspect with the response for COVID-19. Wow. So it sounds like you guys are coming from very um, different places in terms of, of how your native community uh, functions within your state. Uh, uh, Christina, you're more like South Carolina where we only have one federally recognized tribe. We've got nine state recognized tribes, but it's, um, it's very different from you know, other areas that I've traveled to that have um, the, where the native community is very, uh, very much a part of, of the you know, state as a whole because they're, they're larger. Were there any issues, this is for both of you, within the, your, the indigenous communities in your states that have been, um, that already existed, but that have been affected by the onset of the pandemic that are you know, unique to indigenous people? Well, I think, you know, within our healthcare system, it, it's the same thing of what, you know, Afi has already kind of explained is mm -hmm. that, you know, access to healthcare. We do have an IHS facility here that's tribal controlled. And within that, within that are, that's just for in ser services that we can provide at the clinic itself. But any for a specialized care, we have to travel over an hour away or maybe 30 minutes, depending mm -hmm. on where the 
uh, care is provided at. But I, I believe like the health issues yeah. are the health issue, the isolation issue, it just um, the transportation issue is available is there too. But not only that is, you know, we're a very conservative tribe here. We hold our traditions um, very close to us and we, we um, follow it. You know, it follows along with the seasonal patterns and everything. So even in response to that, it's our, our ceremonies and everything have, you know, kind of gotten smaller. And mm -hmm. just because of that risk of being affecting others, being around others, um, the distance requirement and all that kind of stuff. But overall, I think um, the issues that we have with the COVID-19 response, it's been very good. People are very, they're following, you know, the direction of our health director of our tribal leadership in, a, in that sense, so. You know, I don't know that there's so much of a difference as it is a heightening of awareness. I think, you know, lack of access to healthcare has always been a problem in Indian country, particularly with in states where they have rural communities and rural reservations, but I think COVID just really amplifies that. Um, you know, and I do wear two hats, uh, you know, in the state Senate and the, in the Wyoming legislature, I work a lot with the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes. They're unique in the country in that they both jointly occupy a reservation and own it and manage it, most of it together. And then the tribes each have their own, um, you know, some of them can own their own land. But it, it's created a little bit of tension, um, you know, because I think conveniently the federal government likes to treat them as one tribe. So when they, you know, distribute funds for COVID relief, they're happy to do it to, you know, as them as a joint entity, but they're very distinct um, communities culturally, linguistically. And so we've had to really work with our federal counterparts to make sure that they're not treated as the same and that they're treated separately. Um, but kind of just piggybacking off of what Christina said, you know, on the Navajo Nation, um, I'm a member of that tribe. I serve on that gaming enterprises board. And I just think our conversations have been a little different when it comes to whether or not we felt comfortable reopening our casino um, and just taking those extra precautions. Because I think one thing that we really saw in response to the COVID epidemic is a reminder of some of that native history of what happened when things like smallpox entered a lot of native villages and that those people didn't have the immunity. And so some people might view this as ancient history, you know, something you read about in the history books. But I think that there are some tribes who still remember the pain of losing a significant number of their tribal membership due to disease. And so I do think the response is different. And, um, you know, you have to know your history to, to appreciate why that might be the case. Yeah, I agree. You know, trust in the federal government and <laughs> for tribal nations can be, um, yes. it, you know, it's not sometimes not even seeing, you know, like, hey, you guys did this to, already, to us already within those federal Indian policy eras that we've experienced, assimilation, relocation, and all those types of eras that tribal indigenous people have experienced. So yeah, so I, um, with the federal federal government saying, hey, to take the shot, some people may not be trusting that, so. Do you hear that within the community or is it just sort of a, an undercurrent of just general distrust that has, that has been around for a long time? I think it's, gen it's for, for what I hear is general mistrust of authority, mm -hmm. you know, people, we have prior to our own police department, um, we, people always said that people abuse their positions and authority, and that's included, that's why we have our own police department, so that way we can exercise our sovereignty arm of justice on our community land, so um, there, it follows along all, you know, we have all this history behind us of all these eras, of course, there's going to be some level of mistrust there. I think that yes. when when we're through COVID, I don't know that that's even a realistic expectation anymore. I think this is something we're, we're learning to live with. But, um, you know, there'll be a time when we look back at this these days and, you know, we'll have things to look at, you know, what were the vaccination rates per reservation? Mm -hmm. And I think some of that is kind of telling of the, that trust level. Um, it, but it's interesting and, you know, on an academic level, but it's heartbreaking on the human level, um, just the disproportionate impact that COVID's had. Yeah, and it, it really does seem like your leadership and, and you both being leaders within your own communities and tribes, you've, you've been able to overcome the, the general cultural distrust to get people vaccinated and to, um, and to encourage social distancing measures and all of the mitigation measures. So I think that says a lot to your, um, your level of leadership and trust of the leadership within the, the community itself. Mm -hmm. So that's... I think that's that's noteworthy because I can completely see, and we have that in um, 
in South Carolina, just the, you know, the general undercurrent of mistrust, because when has the government really had, you know, the best interest at heart of indigenous people? And it's, uh, it's been, it's been wise to mistrust for in the past, but we don't want to, you know, do that during the, um, the pandemic. The, um, with your background, Christina, in, you know, food safety and public health, have there been, you know, lessons from the pandemic about how to do to your... Okay, so I know there was a little lag there. I'm not sure if that was oh. on my end, but food sovereignty, my position in food sovereignty is yeah, partly food safety, but really food sovereignty, how I view it is being able to, for our people to access healthy foods um, mm -hmm. and being able to grow your own food and being able to um, hunt fish, exercise those rights and bring that all back, reclaim it and bring it back and have the ability to do it. So food sovereignty in itself is very important at this time of pandemic. In Iowa over here, we received, we, endured a derecho storm, straight line winds coming through our land or through Iowa last year where we knocked out electricity. Cities and towns like ours were devastated. Our tribal community had trees knocked over and um, grocery stores, you know, they were out of electricity. How it, there was such a huge response and it was amazing to see how communities had responded um, to help each other, to help feed each other, volunteerism increased and everything like that. And I think that's what we really need for this pandemic is people will need to start helping each other and pulling together and basically uniting, saying that this is so important that we, this is something we need to do. Ours was, we received the pandemic, we have the COVID-19 pandemic. On top of that, we had that derecho storm in Iowa, we're just knocked out of electricity no access to food and all that kind of stuff. So it's good that we grow our own food. It's good that we're able to understand, you know, how to hunt and fish and fillet our, you know, everything like that. Because we are able to survive through that, but I know not a lot are, are able to either. And Afi, let me start with you on this next one. Um, moving forward, uh, what are there lessons that we can learn from the pandemic about how um, indigenous populations can be better prepared to uh, to serve in a public health crisis? I think there will be lots of lessons. And you know, something that can't get lost in this is just um, the lessons that tribal leadership take. You know, I, I serve in the state legislature. I work closely with tribal leadership, but I am very quick to say, you know, I'm a nice Navajo lady who lives in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I don't serve as a, you know, on the councils of either of the tribes. Um, at Wyoming's Wind River. And so I, I do think that we're kind of living in this era of empowerment where um, Native tribal governments are finding a stronger voice and, and making those determinations rather than just relying on the states or the federal government to, to make do that for them. And so, you know, it's it's kind of hard to say what those lessons are, I think, because we're still living it. And we I think some still, distance. we're still getting it right. We're still getting it wrong. Um, you know, and time will tell what we did right and what we did wrong. So um, but I am encouraged by all the leadership I've certainly seen in Wyoming and then being a member of the Navajo Nation. Um, they've been very aggressive with their, um, you know, response. And I'm just really thankful that we have leadership um, at the tribal level and, and thankful for those states who are working cooperatively together with their tribes. Yes. Anything to add on that, Christina? So uh, there's probably a lot to add on that. <laughs> um, within Ivo, you know, we're similar to a lot of different places where we do not have mask mandates in our public schools, and we don't mm -hmm. have, um, you know, those steps that should be implemented here through our state government. And um, on the tribal side, we have them there. You know, we have those safety precautions all in, you know, in the school system. And the level of leadership is so important when responding to disasters. No one was really prepared for a pandemic like this. So yeah, the lessons will be reflected on and you know learned and shared so that way everyone's better prepared. Thank you guys. And so we'll um, shifting gears a little bit to okay. uh, an exciting development nationally. Uh, that's Deb Holland's uh, appointment to as Secretary of the Interior. 
Um, Deb Holland made history this year, um, becoming the first Native American to hold the position of a secretary in a presidential cabinet. Um, Abby, you were the first Native American woman to hold office as senator in Wyoming. And, and that, when I read that, it really surprised me because I would think that what the Wyoming Senate and, uh, and House would be, uh, would have a lot of, of indigenous people serving. Um, aside from just the, pol you know, the political um, significance of that, what's the significance of a Native American woman joining a, uh, a president's cabinet? If you could talk about that and give us well, some insight based on your experience. Yeah, you know, when I was elected in 2016, it was um, a real honor for me. And I think that, you know, most people who run for the legislature in Wyoming, we're a citizen legislature, we don't meet full time. And so, you know, we're, I view us as worker bees, you know, we show up for a very small session. Um, and then during the interim, we work and that's all we do is work. Um, but when I first was elected, I was shocked at the number of students in particular that came from Wyoming's Wind River Reservation to watch the legislature that wanted to meet me, that wanted to shake my hand and get their picture taken. And you start realizing that the significance of these positions is much greater than anything you could ever imagine. And so when Secretary Holland was tapped to serve, um, you know, I knew it was a big deal for Indian country because for so long, um, people, Native people don't see themselves represented in government. And so her appointment to that post has been wildly symbolic. And I can only imagine how excited um, people are when they, when she comes and visits their home states and their tribes. Um, Secretary Holland did make a trip to Wyoming, which we were appreciative of, and, you know, we have um, some staunch opposing views on some political items, but it was really um, important, I thought, that she made the trip to Wyoming, she was the governor and some legislative leadership, but also was willing to travel to Indian country, and, um, you know, for a variety of circumstances, I think she had intended to fly, but had to drive. Wyoming's a big state, that's a lot of windshield time, but she did that. And I think that's the nature of the West. And um, you know, if we get cabinet officials who aren't aware of just the expansive amounts of land we have, how difficult it is to just pop into an Indian reservation, it makes those trips uh, few and far between. So you know, we may not you know see eye to eye on every policy issue, but I, I think her appointment is very significant. And when you think of Native kids in particular, seeing a woman, um, you know, appointed to serve in that in that role, it is very empowering. Yeah, I agree. You know, yes. Secretary Secretary Holland's appointment was Thank amazing you. to see. Thank you for that. And any that's I I ran for serving the house for a while, and I know what you mean, um, Afi, about like when when kids, when you know, especially mothers of daughters, want their daughters to meet you because you're the first of something, and that's um, it's you. You definitely don't want to be the last, but just to know how how inspired mothers are and daughters when when a uh, a woman, especially a woman who uh, who maybe looks like them, is is appointed to uh, to a high office, and it just gives them a whole other um, uh, vision of what their future could be. That's say, uh, and so I agree. Like, you, it doesn't matter, you know whatever you, whatever policy issues you agree or disagree on, the significance of that as a, uh, of that appointment as an inspiration for future generations is, is really, um, is really significant. Do you um, think that um, this appointment will, you know, open doors for future opportunities for people in public service? If y'all could chat as to um, based on this appointment. I, I do think that, um, you know, breaking a glass ceiling is always something. Um, but, you know, in Wyoming, we, we kind of look at what we do. Uh, Wyoming was the first state to guarantee women the right to vote. And, and that was in 1869 when we were a territory. And then in 1870, we, you know, that same with that same um, territorial legislation on suffrage, we also said women have the right to hold office. And so Wyoming promptly appointed a woman to serve as the, the justice of the peace, making her the first woman to ever serve in that capacity in a democratic society. And so, you know, Wyoming's so proud of this and many other first, the first female governor, first female town council. Um, but, you know, in recent years, we see declines in the number of women serving. And in fact, Wyoming has one of the worst percentages of women serving in its legislature. 
So I'm part of a group that um, encourages, if we put on a, a conference encouraging women um, to become more involved. And it's not even just uh, running for office, it's how you become more involved in boards and commissions and giving women a toolbox to do that. And so I think that those kind of appointments when you see not just you know more women serving, but uh, Native women, I, I think that this is, we're just kind of trending in that direction of really um, giving people that idea that you know, maybe I have something to offer to my community. How do I get involved? And I think that that sometimes it sounds so trite, but it's a, an idea that you have to start planning in people and getting them excited about. So, um, you know, her appointment, I think definitely sparks that notion in a lot of people's minds thinking maybe not so much secretary of the interior or, you know, federal or excuse, yeah, like part of the, the presidential cabinet. Um, but my, I would certainly hope that, that it increases involvement at all levels of government. Anything to add, Christina? Well, like, um, well, Christina, you know, Secretary Holland's appointment is so exciting, like I was saying. Uh, she is actually, you know, sparking that, that desire to serve others is very important within our young people. And I believe whenever Secretary Holland, being a woman especially, you know, being able to be appointed like that, it, it's amazing to see. And um, actually was, or, Secretary Holland was um, has undergone the eMERGE training that um, in Arizona, or and I was I actually did the same training here, so I was like so excited and you know it was provided me a little bit more confidence that yes I can win when I ran I actually ran um, pre last year for state legislature and I had won my primary election but I had lost my general election, but that was the first time a Native American has won a primary election for state legislature. So it was like, it was a good, you know, applause. Yeah, it was really good, but it, I'm not there yet. We're not there yet here in Iowa. And um, so seeing Secretary Holland being able, you know, undergone the same training I have and then actually succeeding and getting elected and then further appointed, that was amazing to see. Um, there's so much toolboxes out there. You know, we had, we had an amazing program in Washington, DC that I have gone through was that Washington internship in Native students in DC. So I would like, you know, encourage others, young people, especially to go, you know, seek out those opportunities, um, especially for Native indigenous people. And then we have the new leaders council. I have gone to train, undergone the training. That's, a, we have chapters in all the states and that's available out there. And to help prepare people to run for office, whether it's on school board, whether it's, you know, it's just in your local government, state government or federal government, um, just, I believe Secretary Hahn helped pave that way, that it's possible. Yes, I agree. And Christina, you and I have that in common. I ran for re-election to state legislature in 2020 and, uh, and lost, but it's, uh, 2020 was, was quite a year in, in elections. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it <laughs> but, was. <laughs> um, yeah, but I swear the first time I ran, I, uh, I ran for Senate and didn't make it in 2008. And but that paved the way because you learn so much uh, running a campaign. So um, yes. it's, it's awesome that you did that. I, I want to learn more about um, indigenous people in the legal system and, uh, and tribal law and federal uh, tribal law, because this is something having only one federally recognized tribe in South Carolina and, and not have, and it, it you know, the Catawba is being so small in my state, I don't know a lot about, and, um, and we've had a, a lot of assimilation in South Carolina. So it's, uh, it's not as big of, of, a there's no, there's not a lot of awareness. So um, you know, tribal lands we know are classified as domestic dependent um, independent nations within the United States. Um, so the tribes operate under a unique code of laws that are governed internally. And we happen to have an expert on that with us in the panel. So Afi, could you help us understand more about the ways in which Native American law and US federal law differs and, um, and affects um, that these differences have on indigenous communities and how they function within the whole. Yeah, so anyone that's watching this that has ideas about going to law school, I would encourage you go, <laughs> go to a law school that has a federal Indian law program. And I would encourage you to take that class because um, I think that's a really powerful way that we're gonna change as a country and really understanding what happens on reservations. 
um, to give you a semester in five minutes, you know, I think it is a little helpful to kind of just frame it as, you know, when our country started, the, our country, you know, the founding fathers had to kind of grapple with this notion of how do you claim all this land without extinguishing these human beings. And so unlike what we saw in South America, the kind of, you know, compromise was to say, you know, by the doctrine of discovery, we are entitled to this lands, but, you know, these native people have a right of occupancy. And so right now reservations, and there are some exceptions, um, it's different. Like I said, there are almost 500 different tribes. So Oklahoma is different. Um, Alaska is a little different. The Pueblos in New Mexico are different. But by and large, um, most tribes are held in trust by the federal government. And then the tribe, the Indian people have a right to occupy them. So because of this trust responsibility, the federal government has something um, we call uh, you know, plenary power. So any law that they pass affecting a reservation or Indian people is upheld by the court as a part of Congress's power. So unlike other minority groups, Congress can come in and say, for example, we can have Native American hiring preferences for things like the Department of Interior. Whereas if you were to try and say that you know, for Black Americans, Asian Americans, that would likely violate equal protection. So there's this unique status and what it means on the, you know, I spend a lot of time working on criminal matters. And unfortunately, it's, it's the system we have has been very complicated over the years. Back in the 1800s, um, it was generally assumed that states didn't have any jurisdiction on what happened on Indian lands. And there was this case called um, Ex Parte Crow Dog, where you had two Native American men, one killed the other on the reservation. And per the tribal custom, the tribal law, um, the killer offered the victim's family horses, blankets, and other restitution. And everyone in the tribe was fine with it. That was their custom. But this happened in the territory of South Dakota and the people there, um, the non-Indians were not happy. They said, you know, the, the punishment for murder is to be hung. Um, this man should die. And so they, this case made it up. They tried him in a territorial state court and wanted to execute him. The case made it all the way up to the US Supreme Court and they said um, that state law doesn't apply on reservations. And so, you know, we had a pretty clear line there, but then the people of the territory in the West um, petitioned Congress and they said, you know, these people can't even manage their own affairs. Congress, what are you gonna do? And so they passed something called the Major Crimes Act that says, anytime you have um, a crime committed between two Indians, um, you know, murder, rape, arson, those kind of bigger crimes, it's been now been expanded, I think, to 14 different crimes the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction. So you have all of a sudden layer upon layer of what's, you know, who's who's in charge of trying that offender. And in that same era of time, there were two non-Indians, I think it was in Colorado, one of the cases where there was a murder on Indian lands, but it was between two non-natives. The Supreme Court decided that the state would have jurisdiction. And so it's really complicated. If you take federal Indian law, you will dissect, you know, who has jurisdiction, is it the tribe? having concurrent jurisdiction, the feds having exclusive jurisdiction or the state. And so nowadays you may hear a lot about missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's not, it shouldn't be any surprise to anyone that we've kind of created a perfect storm for a loophole to occur. And um, you know, when it comes to missing persons in particular, you don't know the nature of the crime, where it happened or who did it. And those are all three key factors, knowing the race of the victim, the race of the offender, the nature of the crime and where it happened. If you don't know that, then it's easy to point your finger and say they have jurisdiction or we want jurisdiction. And so those of, um, you know, unfortunately, we've seen higher rates of murder and violent crime in Indian communities. So there's a very robust effort happening in state levels and national levels to try and tease out some of those jurisdictional questions and just provide more accountability and justice for Indian people. Um, so, you know, the difference between tribal law, those are laws that tribes pass and govern reservations. Um, state laws sometimes apply. Um, and sometimes federal law applies. And I gave you a snapshot of how it works on the criminal jurisdiction side. Civil jurisdiction has a whole nother set of rules and it's also complicated. So, you know, one of these days, I, I think it would be nice if Congress really spent some time thinking about simplifying centuries old concepts and notions, Supreme Court decisions, and really tried to find a way to make it um, a little bit more practical. And I think we're starting to see that in the Supreme Court. Um, there was a big issue that just came out involving um, what's called the Cooley case. And I think the justices uh, just recognize some of the practical realities that are out there and the difficulties when we start making it overly complicated in administering justice and keeping people safe. Um, so I'm really encouraged that we're going in the right direction, but there's a, a lot of years and a lot of work ahead of us. 
Wow. Wow. That is, that, that is fascinating. And, um, and I see only just a, a very small uh, smidgen of that in, in South Carolina with our conflicts of laws. Uh, Christina, do you have uh, in Iowa, are y'all, do you have um, any major issues with conflicts of laws in well, as far as tribal law versus well, you know, there's always laws avail out there that kind of conflict with tribal law. Um, we have the, well, there's a, you know, there's a federal le legislation that the Violence Against Women's Act that has been outstanding and hasn't been really passed, it's been passed before. And that provided a lot more protect protection for um, tribal communities, be able to enforce their laws and all that kind of stuff. But you also, you know, in the history of the government, um, we've, we have ICWA, to protect our children, you know, there's sometimes there's some miscommunication between that. I know I experienced it up in South Dakota. I, my mother is from the Yankton Sioux Reservation, which is the Ihantuan Nation. And I've seen that up there as well. You know, there's the Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA. And um, so we constantly have to be able to be on guard, be aware what's going on on the federal, you know, federal level, state level, as well as tribal level whenever we're advocating for these issues and everything so that way justice is served justice is equal and this you know things like that but the different types of land that tribal communities are on is there's trust land there's fee land there's all these different kinds of you know categories of land so with whenever um jurisdiction is you know looked into they have to go back into the history of of the land itself of where it's at sits with the tribe and it must be really difficult. I could imagine, you know, in places like Oklahoma where they had a large allotment during the allotment era, it's all, you know, it's all mixed in with different cities, towns and everything like that. So I could just imagine how, how complicated and complex that area is for, um, you know, just for, to be able to enforce tribal law. Thank you both. And uh, if we could shift direction now to voting rights uh, the issue of voting rights in the United States has come to the forefront in American politics, especially in the wake of the uh, last presidential election and the string of legislation that is uh, being introduced in, uh, in state legislatures around the country affecting voting. Um, Afi, what, if any, voting access issues are Native Americans in your community and across the country facing and, uh, and how do you believe these problems should be addressed? Well, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard for a person like me to, to say, Here, here's how it is today, without really kind right. of giving you some context of kind of how we got here. And so mm -hmm. I do think it's important to recognize that when the constitution of our country was being discussed, um, you know, founding fathers didn't really know what to do with Indian people. Are they part of the citizenry or not? And, you know, there were a lot of tribes that were at war with the United States. And so there was, I think, a common understanding that they were others and not quite fully U.S. citizens. And so when um, the Constitution referred to Native people, you know, it was with that kind of mindset that these are separate um, governing en entities. And it wasn't until some early case law in the 1830s where the Supreme Court started recognizing that that wasn't a totally um, acceptable solution particularly when you had tribes who were starting to be, build strong alliances with the United States and the fact that these were not foreign countries contained, in, you know, separated by seas or boundaries, they were contained geopolitically within the country. And so this kind of evolution of what our tribes, you know, I think for a lot of Indian people, it is important to maintain that separateness. You know, we don't just maintain our U.S. citizenship and our state citizenship. We are also members of our tribes, and that is a legal definition and one that we're proud of to be members of our own sovereign nation. And so that's the thing, the backdrop we need to kind of keep in mind. Um, so, you know, in the late 1880s and early 1930s, as Christina mentioned, our country was in an era of assimilation and it was really the federal government's policy to get native people to act more like non-Indians, you know, become more farming centered communities um, and, you know, even serve in wars. And so a lot of native people served in World War I and at this time, I think the question for policy leaders in DC was, you know, I think that there should be some recognition that these individuals who are born on American soil are citizens. And so in 1924, Congress passed something called the Indian Citizenship Act, which conveyed uh, Native Americans the right to vote. Um, some states though, kind of held on to these old notions that, you know, Indian people aren't taxed, so they shouldn't have a right or a say in government. 
And it took a lot of concerted effort um, in the 19, or excuse me, during the 1900s to kind of reverse some of that thinking. Um, you know, I hear that today, you know, Indian people aren't taxed and that's simply not true. We pay income tax, but the tax structure is different if you live on reservation. And so there are some nuances to that, but by and large, there's no, you know, gaping loophole for Indian people. We all pay all kinds of taxes. I can promise you that. Um, so, you know, in 1965, our country really hit a fever pitch when it started addressing voting rights for other minorities, particularly black Americans. And there was a lot of, um, talk of how you could, you know, get places like the deep South out of some of those, um, you know, very horrible Jim Crow laws. And so Native Americans though, weren't really part of this discussion. Um, because again, I think our country was thinking of them as separate and not, it wasn't the focal point of that act. Um, over time, though, uh, the Voting Rights Act has been amended to clarify that Native Americans are included in its coverage. So Native people occupy this kind of unique status where we are our own political entity, but we can also be recognized and protected under the law as a racial minority. And so that's one area of law that I think we're, we could do a better job as Indian law scholars of teasing out for the courts. Um, but we see, you know, nowadays it's not so much a overt disenfranchisement. I think in a lot of ways they're really benign things. That people don't realize might be problematic and so one area is at large elections and for example a lot of county commissions in wyoming in included we have five seats on the county commission they cycle through and so you know in the years that we vote for three it's the top three vote getters the district isn't divided in its own by neighborhoods and so that's a, those are called single member districts well in 2005 the northern arapaho and eastern Shoshone said well, with these at-large districts, three in Fremont County where they live, we never get Native American representation in the, in the Fremont County Commission. So they sued under the Voting Rights Act and the, the court ultimately agreed. And so in Wyoming, we have one county that has single member districts and it's that one. They have three distinct districts, one that really covers the reservation. And so, you know, I think the, the evolution of this conversation though, has applications when it comes to school boards and school districts. Um, and so I think you're seeing more and more of those kind of challenges in our courts. But when it comes to Native America, I think it's even more unique because we do have that separateness. And so I was reading about a case in Nevada um, dealing with voting rights. And one of the challenges was, you know, when you talk about asking for IDs, I think most people say it's not a big deal, even if you don't drive to go to your DMV and get a state issued identification. But in this case in Nevada, they talked about all of the places where DMVs are located and they're not on the reservation. And it makes sense because those are state government buildings. You usually don't build okay. state government buildings on reservations. So I do think that there are issues out there, but they're not born out of, you know, these this overt racism. I think they're products of just, you know, the practical reality of how states do business. So I think that, you know, as a policy leader in Wyoming, those are the kind of conversations I think we need to be having is how, instead of, you know, battling it out through court cases, how can we proactively talk about those issues? You know, as someone who works in the state legislature, I would never presume that we need a DMV site on reservation land. I think that's a conversation to ask about. And if the tribes in Wyoming are both open to that and want that, you know, I think that's a, a much more proactive way to tackle some of these issues. But, um, you know, I, I don't know what Christina's views are, but I think it's, I just want to emphasize, um, you know, these are not new issues that we're grappling with as a country. We've been grappling with them since the 1700s. So my history, you know, with the vo voting, um, probably early, you know, uh, when when Obama had sparked that interest in politics, in politics into me in 2008 and nine, I was like, yes. So I worked on, we, um, me and my a couple of my friends had worked on um, turning out the vote on the settlement. And it was really important because a lot of people did not actually vote. And it's not, you know, we're not, Custom, are you, we don't, that's not, that's not what we do. We don't vote in the elections as often as we should. And um, because the laws and everything affect our tribal people some way or another. But a few years ago, the state of Iowa had passed a voter IDs law. And as I was reading it, I was checking it out because, you know, if I'm, I need to be aware and informed if I'm going to help people register to vote. So I was like, I looked at it and all the ID requirements that were on there, acceptable IDs, passport, state ID, um, military ID, but what was missing was a tribal ID. So <laughs> I was like astonished that that happened. And I was like, wait, this is not right. You know, what we go through to become an enrolled citizen of our tribal nation 
in our in our tribe especially you know we have to have a blood dna test you know, so yes it's just, so there's a lot of steps to be to even become an enrolled citizen of a tribal nation and by and large it should you know tribal id sh should be recognized as acceptable form of id so what i had done was um there was a native american rights fund um hearing down in oklahoma and i had traveled down there and i expressed that frustration during that time um I, I expressed it at the hearing. I came back into Iowa and I contacted the people I knew on the state level in the state legislature area. And um, we, and by the end of the spring, beginning of summer, that legislation was changed to include, you know, tribal IDs as an acceptable form. But if, you know, a person does, is not aware of um, what's going on or informed in anything, those things, it would have just like went by and, um, sometimes a lot of people don't have the money to purchase a state ID. Well, for tribal IDs, um, usually they become, they're free, they're local, they're easier to access. And um, we do have a voting site within our tribal community here. And that was, uh, that was established by a prior person, Donald Monty Sr., to ensure that our people in, the, in our community has a place to vote. Otherwise, we'd have to travel, you know, miles you know, to the local voting site and everything's like, uh, it was very complicated. But now for every election, there always has to be a voting location on the Mispaki Indian settlement. And that's by people standing up, expressing those concerns and get making things happen. Thank you. Christina, you touched on something that is um, that is especially applicable in my area too, in South Carolina, where you know, so we have so much assimilation uh, and and assimilation by necessity, you know, as growing up, uh, family would say, don't tell anybody you're Indian. And that was because we had black school and white school, but there were like no Indian schools except for in, in one part of the state. And so, but with, even though we have so much assimilation into the white community, uh, there is, it's very hard to get a lot of our, um, our people who have um, what I, I would just say uh, native DNA who feel like they're living within the white community. It's hard to get a lot of them to, um, to vote, to get a driver's license, to, um, I, I was first in my line, in my father's line to have a birth certificate. Uh, and still I have many, many family members who just refuse to participate in voting. And, and how do you, uh, and this is like, if, if you experience that as well, Afi, in, in your community, how, how, um, what do you do to encourage um, members of the community to, uh, to really get involved in, in electoral politics and voting and, and that kind of thing? So I know when I had helped, you know, register voters on the, on the settlement here, uh, it was a lot more of education and providing the opportunities for people to come and learn more about it. You know, just, just as sheer, you know, I don't care how you vote, you know, just vote because these laws affect our people some way or another. We're not on the reservation or on the settlement 100% of our times. Once we stop, you know, um, cross that boundary, we're under state law. Be aware of what's going on at the state level. <laughs> so it's just, uh, I think it was more of educating. And um, when I was younger, you know, in my 20s, I was like, always thought, why do I have to educate so, more, so many people? Shouldn't they already know? And I was like amazed whenever I interned down in Washington, D.C., whether it's through the WINS program or under Senator Harkin, I was like, why am I educating? You know, people all the time, they should know. But yeah, there's like a lack of education in that sense available to Congress, to state legislatures. And, you know, unless it's been developed, I've seen some um, orientations out of the state of Washington, I believe, where they, you, you know, where they are able to educate um, people that are making these important decisions on the state level. And I'm excited, I'm hoping with an orientation in Congress that, that there's something available too, but I didn't see it when I was there. So, so it, I think um, just getting that energy behind, you know, voting, it's important, educating, not only, you know, just the yourself being on the grassroots, educating, get the tribal leadership to be, you know, expressing the same encouragement, so. Right, are you seeing a change in, generationally? 
I, I'm seeing a change. People are more active and they were proud that I had actually ran. I ran in 2012, I did, and I lost in my primary then. So when I ran last year, I won my primary, but you know, so people are getting extra, you know, they're becoming more aware of what the issues are that are out there that are affecting us. I constantly say, you know, we have corn, beans, and squash. We have a river. Our, pre our ancestors had purchased our land adjacent to the Ira River for a reason because there was access to fish and the life there. And um, basically, what happens if we have polluted waters? What happens if we have land that's, you know, just engulfed in all these fertilizers, pesticides, and all that kind of stuff? All the decisions that are being made, they affect us on the federal or state level on growing our food, on living our lifestyles here as tribal people. And um, the educational part of it is it needs to be in schools. Public schools, I graduated from a, a, a tribal school, Marty Indian School up in South Dakota. It was a boarding school and I didn't understand the whole idea. Why was it a boarding school? Why was there a mission there? Why was there a church on campus at school? You know, that, that, did, that was like, I did not know that until later on. And when I was taking these classes, federal Indian policy, whether in Washington DC or I took one in the University of Iowa as well. And I'm like, oh, I see how all these you know, laws have are coming into play in my life. Why we have so much of a large urban population, Indian population, Native Americans in urban areas like Omaha, where I was born. <laughs> Why was I born there? But um, so all, a lot of these policies are interesting and being able to have our, an opportunity to spread that same message, share it with our youth, our younger people as they're growing up in our civics class, it should be shared, history should be shared. Um, just the constant education and the support of those that are running should be, you know, seen more. Now, Abby, I would assume in Wyoming, there's a great um, uh, involvement of indigenous people in politics because there are so many more, but finding out that you were the first Native American woman to be, or Native American in the Senate was, was surprising too. So it sounds like y'all might have some reluctance to, get involved in the in the political system as well. Is that accurate? Well, I can touch on that, but let me, before I forget, I just wanted to touch on something Christina said about voter identification. So in Wyoming, we talked about, you know, acceptable forms of ID and that issue of why can't we use our tribally issued identification card came up. And I would agree with her. It is, for anyone who thinks it's easy to get that card, it's not. I mean, you either have to do DNA testing and for Navajo, it's, you know, blood quantum, you have to meet a certain threshold. Um, but so we looked at the issue and there's some federal barriers. The Help America Vote Act said that you have to, there's a tiered system of what they require. And so our workaround was you can use a tribally issued ID, but it either has to have your, your driver's license number, which is a state issued number, or the last four digits of your social security number, which is a federally issued number on there. So that was our yeah, workaround. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't perfect, but that's how we tried to tackle that issue. Um, and all the things that Christina said are accurate, you know, uh, when it comes to, and I, I did want to clarify, Nevada, the issue that aired was the voting sites and where they were located, the issue about DMV sites was in actually North Dakota. Anyway, I just want to clarify that. But, um, you know, my family, my mom and dad were born, both born in the 1930s, neither of them were born in uh, hospitals. And it wasn't until they were around the age of 65 that we thought, well, they might be eligible for Medicare, so we should enroll them. And we discovered that my dad was we'd been celebrating his birthday in October. He was actually born in September. And so we started the paperwork for my mom and actually found out she was two years older than she, we had always celebrated her birthday in December and it, she was born in May. I mean, you, you just can't explain this. You can't make this stuff up, right? So yeah. um, to anyone who's cynical about some of these challenges, they're very real. Um, mm -hmm. And then along those lines for people living on reservations, they don't always have physical addresses. And some of those um, you know things are required for certain forms of ID. So we're, we're sorting through those challenges, but um, I think that you know there's there's the motivation on the human level, but there's also the structural level. You know, as I mentioned, Wyoming, we used to have um, at-large elections for our state legislature, and so at the time we saw a lot more women serving. And I think the thinking, and this is all anecdotal, but things we talk about um, is you know if my my county, for example, has five senators, we're the largest you know metro area of Wyoming, which I know a lot of people watching can laugh about. Wyoming is the least populated state. But um, you know, if we had five allocated seats for the Senate, it would be the top five vote getters. 
And when we had that system, I think that voters probably thought, well, you know, I wouldn't mind having a couple Democrat or a Democrat, four Republicans, and then maybe a couple women in there. Um, and that's changed. Now we have single member districts. And so really it is finding that one person in that one community that you're going to recruit to run and that's going to run an effective campaign. And so once we went to single member districts, we saw a huge dive in the number of women that serve. And so, I mean, I don't think we go backward, I mean, toward single, you know, getting rid of single member districts. But I do think that some of the policies we pass with really important intentions sometimes have the opposite effect of maybe diluting some diversity in our, our governing institutions. So, you know, I think that it is important to inspire individuals and candidates to run and give them tools and training to do that. But I also think there are some structural questions, you know, and certainly with the, the Wyoming legislature, one thing we talk about a lot is the fact that we're a citizen legislature. So, you know, a lot of the work that I do is donated time. It's time that I, I take away from my law practice. Not everyone's um, in a financial position or a, a job that they can do that. And so you know, I think by the nature of that, we discourage young people from running because they're starting families and you know, they've got careers, they're just getting off the ground. But I think some of those considerations bleed over into you know, why we don't have larger minority representation at all levels and specifically Native Americans. So um, I just wanna offer like, there's, there's not one solution. I think there's structural as well as very individual things that to, we could consider if um, we wanted to make some of those changes. But, it's complicated and it's not easy. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This has, I have learned a great deal from this and I'm sure everyone watching has as well. And so just to, um, to wrap up now as ACYPL's exchange work transitions to virtual engagement during the COVID-19 pandemic, it is vital that the impacts and efforts of the virtual down, uh, town hall series uh, are measured for ACYPL funders. And so we seek to do this through a short exit survey that will ask you to note one key takeaway from the session in addition to uh, just a few other questions. Uh, Zoom attendants may view the survey link on the Zoom post attendee screen and will also receive it in an email tomorrow. Viewers on Facebook Live and YouTube can find the survey link in the video description on the respective platform. And we're gonna thank you in advance for taking the survey. It really helps out ACYPL in showing our funders that, uh, that we've been uh, especially effective. Um, and it helps us measure the impact of uh, programming during this time. Uh, make sure to tune in to ACYPL's next virtual town hall on September the 9th. The focus of that one will be trade and it will be moderated by ACYPL CEO, Libby Rosebaum. Panelists for this event will be ACYPL alums Brian Diffel and Michael Ngamont. I'm sure I've butchered his name. And so my apologies to him. Uh, <laughs> and thank you so much, Afi and Christina, for, for being here today. And I, I just uh, and want to thank ACYPL again, I think, uh, speaking for all of us for the uh, the ways in which it has affected us personally and the trajectory of our own lives and careers and to all of the ACYPL alums. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful family to be a part of. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you.